I need to come around there. As soon as I get over there, we'll get started, okay? okay. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth youth forum of the school year. I'm Kasav Kasana, a junior at Solon High School and a member of the City Club of Cleveland's Youth Forum Council. I'm pleased to introduce today's forum, a conversation on disparities in youth mental health care. Inaccessibility to high quality mental health care services, cultural stigma, lack of resources, lack of awareness, inability to afford insurance, all of these issues and more have contributed to disparities in mental health care in the United States. Some of the biggest disp disparities are seen among children and youth who can experience poor mental health outcomes based on their socioeconomic status, gender or sexual identity, ethnic or racial minority status, or immigrant status. 
Studies show that African American and Hispanic children and young adults receive significantly less behavioral health care than their white counterparts. If they do receive care, it is often worse quality and less culturally competent. In some cases, health issues among minority youth often disproportionately result in punishment or incarceration, not health care. Our panelists today to discuss this topic include Archie Green, mental health advocate and founder of Peel Dem Layers Back, Charday Hollins, the Children's Program, Program's Behavioral Health Prevention Spe uh, Specialist at the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County, Dr. Dakota King-White, an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling, Administration, Supervision, and Adult Learning at Cleveland State University, and Dr. Aaron Mutio, Director of Day Treatment Centers and Positive Health, uh, Education Program. Here to guide our discussion is youth forum member Arimlo Orasanya, a sophomore at Pinecrest Academy Homeschool. Arimlo, I turn the forum over to you. Thank you, Kasab, for that introduction. We are glad to have you all here for our fifth forum of the school year, and we, have, we hope to have you join us for the last youth forum next month. Today, however, we're here to discuss disparities in youth mental health care. In recent years, the broadness of mental health has expanded. Before, mental health would just be mental. Yet, over the past few years, we've realized mental health could be a number of things, such as schizophrenia, autism, anxiety disorders, depression, and even eating disorders. Mental health is now defined as emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It consists of your feelings, emotions, thinking, and moods, and it involves being able to successfully navigate the complexities of life, develop fulfilling relationships, adapt to change, and utilize appropriate coping mechanisms to achieve well-being without discrimination. Once someone has been diagnosed with a mental health illness, they need treatment. That brings us to the, to the issue of disparities in our mental health care system. Dr. King-White, we'll start with you. Where would you say is the most dis glaring disparity in our mental health care system? What I would say from the treatment and from my work, I've done a lot of work in K through 12 schools. And what I have noticed, um, in some school districts, you have school counselors in elementary, middle school, and high school. But in many of our urban school districts, we do not see even elementary school counselors. So one of the biggest concerns that I have um, as, a, as a professor in school counseling is just the need for us to address the social and emotional um, basic needs of students at an early age. Um, the sooner that we do that, then the sooner I think then we can be able to help kids not only in elementary but middle school and high school. So I think the biggest disparity that I've seen is making sure that within school systems that we're addressing those social, emotional, and mental health needs, um, especially in our areas where kids may not um, be able to access mental health treatment outside of the school setting. Studies have shown that um, half of all chronic mental Ill illnesses start by age 14. How do we ensure that people are able to identify someone with a mental health issue? Um, it seems as if, uh, as being a teen, it's more difficult to realize if it's just a teen misbehaving or if it's a teen with a mental health issue. Um, Archie, uh, I'll ask you this: How 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 is a normal how is a parent supposed to um, be able to determine if it's a child with a mental health issue or if it's just a child that um, a, a teen with a that's misbehaving? I would say um, the most important thing is education on what mental illness, what mental health is. I'm proud to say that I got I received my mental health first aid certification two weekends ago at the Adams Board building. Uh, that was graciously, graciously funded by NAMI Greater Cleveland. I recommend that every single person in this room gets mental health first aid certification. Education is the number one thing that can help in terms of knowing the signs as well as communicating to someone who is in need. Like how do I, because the thing about it is it's just an, one of the most cliche or normal analogies is a broken arm. You see someone in a cast, or a sling, you ask, how's everything going? How's the healing process going? When someone is dealing with something mentally, it's not necessarily uh, something that you can see. It's not something that you, know, you can get a sling or a cast for. It takes, it's a process. 
And so you have to know how to communicate. And part of the, some of the issues in terms of how parents deal with their kids or their youth is sometimes they judge. Like, why are you in the bed? Why are you spending all this time in your bed? You need to be up, you need to be studying, you need to be doing all of this. And the thing about it is, to someone who's uneducated, if, if their child says, mom, I would, but I can't. The phone is right there, I can't lift up the cell phone. Not because I choose not to, but this debilitating illness that is depression, that is anxiety, that is bipolar disorder, whatever the case may be, is preventing me from doing that. So I think the first thing is just educating yourself on what mental illness is and then how to communicate, how to be judgment free when you're dealing with your youth. Sure, Dave, being that you're on the Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County, what, are, what, are, what is that board doing to educate people and let them know um, how to deal with people with mental health issues? Very good question. Um, similar to what Archie was saying, um, by providing these types of trainings like um, Mental Health Youth First Aid, um, we do not provide direct service, but we partner with um, over 60 agencies, providing them with uh, different conversations and funding and helping with implementation and development of programs that can be used for education and services. So I want to echo what he said in the fact of take um, take benefit of these free programs that are accessible to you um, through your local board um, and through all the other agencies that we partner with. Uh, we also make want to make sure that we are working with different agencies that serve a variety of populations. Um, most recently we do have a faith-based organization because we recognize that within various cultures, specifically the African American community, a church is a very important instrument within the way that they function in their culture. So because of that, the board recognized that it is important to start in involving that um, area in providing and helping with prevention services. So we are definitely open and trying to make sure that we are staying relevant and effective in the services that we provide as well as the partners that we choose to work with. Great. And how do we build partnerships with um, schools being that children spend most of their time there? Great question. Um, one of the agencies, one of the things that we work with that specifically my role is working with the school-based um, mental health service providers. So we have several that we do work with that provide counseling and therapy as well as connecting to resources within the schools. So I know some of you may are from different districts, your Beachbrooks, Belfairs, Applewoods, Catholic Charities, Murtis Taylor, um, Belfair, Ohio Guidestone, Cleveland Christian Home. Those are our partners that we work with to make sure that they are in the schools because we recognize that the youth are there for the majority of the time and providing services. So you're getting on someone's caseload, you're able to meet with them on a weekly basis, whether it's individualized or whether it's in a group setting. Um, and they also come out into the community because we recognize that not everybody has that transportation or not, um, if they're in the school, they may be busy taking a test or whatever the case may be and we also want to get the family involved so mom or dad may not be able to come to the school and be a part of a session so we are committed to making sure the providers are able to go into the home and be able to do that holistic approach within the family structure. In moving on to social media and mental health, um, in 2012, researchers found an increase in teen symptoms of depression um, and suicide risk factors and suicide rates also rose in 2012. Around the same time, smartphones and social media became popular. What is social media hurting our mental health? Um, Aaron, could you take that? Um, yeah, that was the one I was hoping I want to get, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and Sharday forgot to mention PEP. So Positive yeah. Education yeah. Program, we're also in the schools working with kids. Um, this, as far as social media and mental health, I, I think it's a double-edged sword because for a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of groups, um, LGBTQ, kids with individuals with autism spectrum disorders, um, social media and that connectivity through social media pulls them out of isolation. They find out other people like them. 
um, feeling depressed, then you can go online, you can find a group of other people that are in similar situations. So there's, there's a lot of positive aspects to it. Um, the challenges are that uh, kids and adolescents' brains are still developing, so not always thinking about future time perspective, consequences, and unfortunately social media captures some of that in time. Uh, for the panelists up here, growing up we made mistakes, but it wasn't captured in time, so our kids can't read about when we had a hard time in seventh grade and we talked back yeah. to some kid that was bothering us. That's gone. Um, so back to the education, I mean, it, it's informing the, the parents so they're aware of what their child needs to, to make sure that they're supportive and speaking openly about social media. It's a tool that can be helpful, but it has to be monitored. And I, I just wanted to add to it. I mean, one of the things that I always talk to my friends, my followers about is taking social media breaks, especially when dealing with trauma. So like, you know, it's funny, I actually spoke at Gen Academy last month. It was a week before Kobe passed away. And I was talking to those young men about the importance of being able to cry, mm -hmm. the vulnerability. Um, but once that happened, when Kobe had passed away, I, I automatically snacked, snapped into survival mode to turn off the social media. And I posted on my Twitter account, get off of social media right now. Because you read, you keep reading about what's going on, what happened, you keep reading and getting more details about this traumatic event that happened, you carry that trauma with you, you internalize it, it weighs you down and it can lead to toxic behavior. I mean, there's countless examples of, especially for all of the, you know, the young black men who see other black men being gunned down every day on social media. You know, so it's very important to just practice, practice the right amount, the right amount of usage. Like for me, like I turn off alerts that come to my phone. So like if it's Insta Instagram and Facebook, I don't get those alerts. The only way I can tell that there's an update is I actually open up the app. So those are ways that you can kind of protect yourself from being sucked in to the social media loop that happens, is turn off the alerts. That way at least you're in control of how often you have access to these different social media accounts. So Sade, would you say it should be on the, uh, the user to manage their to manage what they see on their social media feed, or should it be on um, a parent, or or or, or maybe just um, setting boundaries uh, by? Should it be on like a a social media company to set boundaries like that? In several things in life, I think all of us play a part in what it is that should and needs to happen, right? You know, we have our own personal responsibility to make sure that we guard ourselves and that we're able to identify what we should look at and what we shouldn't. Of course, parents as well should be a part of that conversation, and they have all of these wonderful new gadgets of being able to... Um, like take away certain websites, whatever the case may be, when you're on a phone through Verizon or Sprint or whatever the case may be. Um, and then also, yes, the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, which and they have a part to play as well. What should we look at it? Um, a lot of those entities have taken things. They, they have it where you can report or where they block or where they take things off. But at the end of the day, it really comes to us as individuals. And I'm a strong believer that when we as individuals make a statement that we're no longer interested in those things, then people will stop posting them. And the reason why they're getting posted and is because there's likes. And the reasons why there's likes is because we're double tapping. So each person plays a very key role in, make, in what is being presented to society because we are literally their audience. And they're posting it because um, statistics are telling them that we want to see it. So we are responsible for changing that dialogue and letting them see that we're not interested. Um, and that's on everyone. Okay. Speaking of media, let's discuss 13 Reasons Why, a Netflix show that premiered in March of 2017. 
There has been lots of discussion and debate surrounding this show, some stating it glorifies and justifies suicide, others saying watching 13 Reasons Why brought light to serious issues and raised awareness. Aaron, what impact do you think the show has had on our youth? Um, I would first have to admit I have not seen the show. I'm, I'm aware of it, and it was something that we talked to our students about, about being careful. Um, I think that anything that raises awareness, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about suicide. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about depression. Um, but you have to create the right setting in order to, to be able to respond to what the individuals in the room, um, when they, what they emote and what they verbalize. We have to be prepared to respond to that. Um, so it's dangerous when that stuff is put out there without the resources and supports available to respond. So when we talk about um, disparities in access to mental health, if there's not a continuum of services available with teachers and social workers and mental health providers in the schools, and you show something like that without the supports, it, it's dangerous and can lead to problems. Um, the real issue is all those other supports and resources aren't there. Uh, but until they are there, we need to be careful with that sort of media. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Archie, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, I would say the same thing. I mean, it's very, I, well, I appreciated it. Um, you know, I watched both seasons. Um, I thought it was an amazing show, but it's very triggering. And if you, you know, I myself, you know, because I've been going to therapy for the last almost six years, I know how to, I know how to cope. I have different coping mechanisms that I utilize, but if you're someone who's uneducated on that, then it, it can be dangerous. It can put you in a dark place if you're witnessing or watching something that triggers a memory of some type of trauma or some type of occurrence that puts you in a depressive state. So I think although it, it's, it's important that we do show movies and, and tell stories of that nature, it is important to also be educated on how to protect yourself from those type of triggers as well. And if I may, I do want to take this opportunity to, um, a lot of times when we're talking about suicide and media, it, it's at times can be looked at as if people are getting more attention now that they are gone than they were when they were alive. And that's really the conversation that's causing such concern. And it is very important that as young people, as well as adults, that everyone realizes that your life matters while you are still breathing. It is the most important thing because you still have impact. And there are people in your life who care about your existence. And there are things out there that can, um, that can work with you and that can talk to you. And there are other people who feel the way that you feel. And it's important that we come together and that we utilize the resources and we are educated about what's out there so that if we ever find ourselves kind of having these types of thoughts, that we recognize that there is help that I can receive. So I do want to encourage you that if you find that one of your friends or that you yourself or that your parent, because adults definitely struggle as well with these types of thoughts, are going through these things, um, ask, ask someone, talk to someone, write a note. There's just, um, there's so many things we go around, we talk about um, different suicide prevention um, techniques and strategies. So that's something that is a part of a conversation that the Adams Board does support. Um, but there's, I just wanted to utilize this platform um, since we're on this, com this topic to encourage someone to get that help and to talk to someone if needed. And the other thing that's just the last thing I want to add is me personally, um, I don't subscribe to the statement commit suicide. Absolutely. I subscribe to the statement succumb to mental illness because I, I know how, I know what would push someone to want to commit that act. That is the only, when you're depressed or faced with depression, anxiety, all these different thoughts that you can't control, all you want is a sense of control. And so the one thing that you can control is taking your own life to end this pain, to end this. And I'm sorry if that's triggering anyone in this room or anyone that's watching. But, you know, suicide is not it's not a cowardly act. It's not a it is the only thing. It's the last ditch effort to stop the pain. So that's the other thing I want to make sure that people are aware of. You know, I think there's a misconception with what suicide is. It is not like. 
It's not a bold or courageous or cowardly thing. It is the only thing a person in that mind state feels that they can control. Whether it be self-inflicted harm or um, from the authorities, I think we can all agree that death is the worst possible um, end result. But studies show African Americans with mental health conditions, particularly schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, and other psychoses are more likely to be incarcerated than people of other races. I'm not sure if you all heard of the story last month of um, a, a mother who took her child to the hospital. It was a black young male. Um, and she took him to the hospital because he was having a mental health issue at the time. But he wouldn't get out of the vehicle. So there were the security at the security guards at the hospital um, wanted to help get him out. But uh, through the process, they ended up beating him and um, holding him down for five minutes until four other uh, sheriffs came to stop that. How can we? How can we? end things like this from happening completely? I was just going to say, I think one of the main main things that we have to do, we have to bring just more awareness to what mental health is versus mental illness. And I think when we talk about this whole concept of mental health, we have to be able to understand that everyone has mental health mm -hmm. and that mental illness means that there is some type of diagnosable <laughs> disorder. So when we think about this, we have to also be comfortable addressing cultural beliefs around mental health and me mental illness. So I think the main thing that we really want to focus in on with this is making sure that we're bringing awareness and helping parents and caregivers and guardians within the community feel comfortable talking about mental health and mental illness and not only feeling comfortable but talking about what their kids need in order to thrive. So with this young man, and I'm not, um, I'm not, I haven't heard this story, but when we think about young teenage boys, um, specifically African American or um, elementary age boys, um, a lot of times these disorders do go undiagnosed mm -hmm. for various reasons. So I think the main thing is just to one, bring more awareness, but also empower the parents and the caregivers with tools to be able to advocate for their children, to be able to say what their kids need, and not to be ashamed of the diagnosis. Um, so I think, you know, we talk about cultural differences, when we talk about mental illness, a lot of that um, needs to be discussed, and we have to not be ashamed if our kids do have a mental illness or have, like, mental health concerns. It's part of the main, the main, my uh, initiative with Pilgrim Lairs back, you know, we use hip hop as a means to break the stigma, mm -hmm. you know, so part of the reason why, like, which, you know, I dress the way I dress, I speak the way I speak, I do the type of things I do because it's me, but hip hop is me. And so when I talk to youth, they identify with that because what are they listening to? They're listening to Uzi, they're listening to the baby, all these different forms of hip hop. But at the same time, to hear from someone of that culture that's vulnerable, that's telling a story of, man, like, yeah, I fell down, I was crying, I was hurt, you know, and, but that's okay. It, it, it allows young black males to open up in ways that they might not have previously known that they could. Because as a black man in this country, you know, we live with the chip on our shoulder. We supposed to be strong and we supposed to, you know, not, not be vulnerable or not cry. And that's a lie. Mm -hmm. The first thing I am before I'm a black man is a human being. And that is the one thing that separates us as a species from any other species on this planet. We have emotion. And so the biggest lie that we've been told as black people is that we have to always be strong and suppress. I remember I, I, uh, I did an interview with Vice years ago, which is really what led everything to where I am today. And I remember the day before, and I know my dad's watching, so he's going to be mad at me, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> but the day before my, my interview with Vice came out, uh, my dad had, I had been talking to a friend and his his father about my depression and what I've been going through and my dad called me and was like man you gotta you know you gotta be careful with how you know what type of information you're sharing about your mental health and all that and it's like you know I was like yeah dad I'll, I'll keep that in mind even though he didn't know the next day millions of people were gonna read this interview <laughs> about 
my condition. But the other thing about it is that I tell folks about telling your story is you're not only helping yourself, you're helping someone else in the room that's going through the same exact thing. Depression, mental illness disorders are just as common as the cold mm -hmm. because your brain is a muscle. So going to therapy is just like going to the gym. So I try whenever I speak to young black male, black male youth, is I do the best that I can using hip hop as a means to normalize the conversation around it. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, to an answer your question, there's several things. So one, um, similar to how we ne need to be culturally competent in how we provide services, we need to be culturally competent in how we see triggers and symptoms because how somebody shows that they are depressed or they are having anxiety or whatever the case may be can be totally different than someone else. Some people become isolated and they come, become very quiet and um, just keep to themselves while others act out by fighting, by yelling. And many times those are those who are within that minority group and they are the ones who end up incarcerated because their acting out behaviors are not because they're bad or because they just have this desire to terrorize the world. It's because they're going through something. They are going through depression. They have traumatic experiences, but this is the outlet. So a lot of times because of um, that disparity and not being um, educated or confident and how we identify symptoms, we feel fear. And that fear um, relates to criminal behavior and really it's a mental health condition. And so we need to be very aware of that. Also, um, part of the mental health is what, like you said with this cold, people see mental health and think either I'm sick or I'm perfect, and it's not like that. When you have a cold, the first thing you do, your nose starts dripping a little bit, you get, the, you get a little scratch in your throat, right? But if somebody comes up to you and they say, oh, are you sick? No, I'm not sick. And then somebody comes in and they're just coughing and sneezing. Now they're sick, right? But the difference is that you're on your way to getting sick, so what do you do? You take precautions, you take measures. So mental health and mental illness is not just this, I'm good, I'm bad, it's a scale, just like with your health. It's a scale of how you have a bed, belly ache. It's a scale of you coughing or sneezing. And you need to go to the doctor. You need to do some coping. You need to separate yourself from people. Whatever that strategy is to make sure that you get rid of your cough, you get rid of your belly ache, you get rid of your headache. The same goes with your physical health as it does with your mental health. Great. Thank you. Matt? Good afternoon. My name is Matt Wilson a junior at Sloan High School, and a member of the Youth Forum Council. Today at the City Club, we are listening to a discussion on disparities in youth mental health care. Today's panel features Archie Green, a mental health advocate and founder of Peels and Lawyers Back, Shardae Hollins, the Children's Program's Behavioral Health Prevention Specialist at the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County, Dr. Dakota King-White, an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling, Administration, Supervision, and Adult Learning at Cleveland State University, and Dr. Aaron Mutio, Director of Day Treatment Centers at Positive Education Program. Our moderator today is Ormilio Orsanya, sophomore at Pinecrest Academy Homeschool and, men and member of the youth City Club Youth Forum Council. We're about to begin the audience Q&A session. We welcome questions from everyone. City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our live stream. We ask that your questions be brief, to the point, and actual questions. <laughs> if you have a question, please text your question to the number you'll see on the screen, and your question will be read for you. If you're joining, via, or if you're joining us via our live stream and would like to ask a question, tweet your question to at City Club Youth, and we'll ask, and we'll ask as time allows. Reading questions today is Youth Council, uh, is youth council member Amin Daga. May we have the first question, please? How do we deal with bullying both in schools and outside of schools that goes unaddressed? How do we deal with bullying both inside and out of schools that goes unaddressed? That's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think that I think it's empowering the voice of kids. Um, I think that we talk a lot about the continuum of services and we end up talking about professionals, but I don't know if we give enough opportunities to just give kids voice and make sure they have space to speak openly. 
Um, and, and if that situation is set up, there's circumstances set up where, where kids feel comfortable and safe to speak openly, feel psychologically safe, um, and they have some connection with adults, it's more likely they're going to be able to talk through it. Um, to talk through openly about the bullying and figuring out how to have healthy relationships with each other. Um, so it just, you have to have, a lot of the work is up front so that there's space there where you can have healthy conversations to work through it. Also, I think things like um, what City Club is doing and having a forum where youth can come together to talk about different issues is very important because you're coming together with people who are like-minded, who are interested in learning the way that you are. And it's funny because you can be in different, different environments and bullied for different things. In one environment, you're bullied for being smart. In the other environment, you're bullied for not having a 99 on the test. You know, In one environment, you're um, bullied because you don't have the... You you know, most up-to-date clothes or technology and the other environment you are, you're bullied for having it because you're seen as uppity or you know spoiled so in reality what's important is that we surround ourselves with people who are like-minded in the fact of togetherness not necessarily because you have the same things but because you have the same mentality of bringing each other up and making um, your environment a better place which is very similar to what you guys are here for today Oh, oh, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, Archie. I was going to say, for the, for the students in the room, when we talk about bullying, I know that's been a word. Everybody's like, oh, kids are just throwing it around. And, and as a school counselor, I heard a lot of kids come in and say, well, I told this teacher and this teacher didn't listen. Or I told this administrator and the administrator did not um, listen. What I'm going to say, I encourage the students, if you feel like your voice is not being heard, and I think this is going back to what we've just been saying, the power in your voice, if you feel like someone you're telling is not listening, make sure that you go to someone else who you feel will listen to what it is that you're saying about being bullied. Um, because we've seen kids even take their lives around being bullied in schools. And that's the last thing that we want. Um, and you know that old saying when we were in school, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. As a school counselor, I say that is not true. And words can definitely hurt, hurt children. So I would definitely say if you feel like you're being bullied, harassed, even on social media, any of those things, make sure you tell a trusted adult and someone you know who's going to listen and take what you say to heart. Absolutely. And, uh, I would piggyback on everything that was offered that um, for me, you know, dealing with any type of bullying or negativity or trauma, I channel into my art. So, you know, for anyone who might be going through any type of trauma like that, channel into an exercise. It doesn't have to necessarily be music. You know, it could be listening to music or putting together a playlist. It could be blogging. It could be uh, painting. But channel it into something. One of the, the major things for me is putting that into, into my music. Like, I remember, and I'm actually a proud Solon alum, so shout out to all the Solon alums in the room. Um, I remember when I transferred to Solon, I was, you know, I was going through depression undiagnosed at that time. And I remember, you know, because I had grown up in Chagrin Falls and that school system where I was the only black kid, you know, when I finally went to a school where there were other kids that looked like me, I was somewhat bullied or ostracized because I was articulate. Or as those kids would say, you talk white. You know, but I was at a school where I was the only black, where I was, you know, quote unquote, not black enough. You know, and so I wrote a song about killing myself within the first semester that I was at that school. Now, I didn't share that song with anyone. I think I kept it for like maybe three days before I deleted it. But I expressed how I felt, unfiltered. That is how I felt. I felt ostracized. I felt like an outcast. And saying that out loud, putting it into a song, was my form of release therapy. So it's just like uh, for all the Kanye fans in the room, when he came out with his album, Ye, the first song I thought about killing you, one of the things he says in that is like, people always say like, don't say that out loud or don't say any negative things. Say it out loud, see how it feels. So find that trusted adult, find that trusted friend, that counselor who you can speak to about what's going on. That, I would say that in addition to everything else that was offered. And for those students who are doing the bullying, how can we ensure that they also get the treatment that they need? Mm -hmm. Very good 
good question. Um, I think that that is something as adults that we need to recognize. And it goes back to what I was saying about how we need to realize that people who are going through different things have different symptoms. So that person who is do doing the bullying it's going through something yes. that's depression, anxiety. It's being bullied themselves. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. had a traumatic experience. Yes. So I'm going to, as a clinician, I'm going to talk to the person who's experiencing the bullying, but I'm also going to have a conversation, not in a way that is going to penalize. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not talking to you because you're in trouble, you have detention, which you know there are avenues where that may be needed for education or whatever the case may be. But as far as mental health, I'm talking to you because clearly something's going on. And I think as people, we, if we also take the mentality that the person who is inflicting pain on us is going through pain, it allows us to be a little bit more um, empathetic. Even though it's hard, it's tough. Like, why should I care how they feel when they don't care how I feel? But the thing about it is they do care how you feel. That's why they're picking on you. Mm -hmm. And they care yep. about how you feel so much that they have chosen you to, to target. And because of the value that you have in the world, they are hoping that by choosing you, they themselves will receive more value. Mm. You're so important mm. that because I don't feel good about myself, I'm going to pick on you so that everybody else can think I'm important. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's how you have to think about this yeah. concept and how you can allow yourself to be self-empowered to recognize that nothing is wrong with me and why people are targeting me or why this person just won't let me live it down. Something is right with me. And not just because of what they see, but because I have that power inside of me to be self-sufficient and resilient and to beat this and to be a better person. So be empowered that someone sees something so wonderful in you that they chose you to pick on. But still tell somebody. <laughs> okay. Still tell somebody. Tell a friend, tell an adult, and make sure that both of you all are getting the help that you need. <laughs> All right, it seems like all the panelists have some connection to the arts and mental health. Can you guys talk about the role of arts in mental health? I'll take it and then I'll hand off to Archie because he'll know more than me. <laughs> um, in our work, with we work uh, K to 12 primarily with the day treatment centers that PEP operates. And um, so all of the kids that we have are struggling some way emotionally or behaviorally. And when you think about mental health, you often think about a therapist 50 minutes a week, Wednesday night, you go in, you sit on a couch, and you talk about your feelings. A lot of kids we work with are not ready for that. Um, if you ask them what's wrong or what they need or what happened, they, they don't know. They're just not at that place yet. We, we need to first work on regulating them, giving them to a calm place. And we've learned um, recently through our partnership with uh, Dr. Bruce Perry about how these interventions need to go sequentially. So regulating and, and, and helping individuals get to a calmer state, which one way could be through art, through music, through dance, um, and then building those relationships, those trusting relationships and connections, and then you move to the more cognitive work. Um, so it has its place primary for kids, I think, uh, because they have developing brains and that we're trying to get them to a calm place first, and then later on we're gonna talk about some coping skills and how to manage it and why this is helping you calm down and why this is helping you grow as a person. Now I hand it off to you. <laughs> so um, this is this is something that's very important to me as far as using utilizing the arts uh, as a vehicle for uh, educating and empowering the community on mental health. Um, so last year I actually um, was uh, I got the opportunity to do a project. Um, I was part of. Uh, CAC, uh, uh, Calgary Arts and Culture funded project called Learning Labs, where myself, 12 other artists and 12 nonprofits went through a training cohort to learn how to do a public arts project. Um, and for me, um, it's been very important working within the Cleveland Metropolitan School District in particular after I learned a very disturbing uh, statistic in a 2017 CDC study that stated that at that time, uh, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District was number one in suicide rates in the nation. So what that meant was two in every ten high schoolers had attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I've been trying to figure out a way to basically work within the Cleveland Metropolitan School District um, to bring some type of program there. One of the nonprofits that was part of the Learning Labs training cohort was the Lexington Bell Community Center, which is based in the historic Huff neighborhood 
in the heart of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. And so we came together and we put together this organic uh, project which blended my passions for mental health as well as my passions for hip hop and classical music. And we put together this project called My Violin Weighs a Ton, uh, where we address three areas of growth with the students, social anxiety, parental engagement, and acts of kindness in efforts to make them better than they were, even though these kids were already amazing, um, than when we started working on the project. And so we did lyric writing workshops. We partnered with the Cleveland Classical Guitar Society, taught them how to play guitar, but instead of teaching them a classical record, we taught them how to play Old Town Road. You know, it was their choice. They wanted to do Old Town Road because it was something that they connected with. And they ended up writing their own version of the song. Um, and so uh, through a gracious partnership with the Cleveland uh, Orchestra, we were able to bring a final culminating concert to Severance Hall. The first time there had ever been a hip hop classical concert in those walls. We galvanized the entire arts and culture space community. Um, because the other, my other goal with wanting to work with in Severance Hall was also bridging the gap of diversity, equity, and inclusion with the fact that, you know, when I would go with my family or with, uh, with my wife to see a concert at Severance Hall, most of the people that worked there looked like me, but most of the people on stage or in the audience were predominantly white. And so I wanted to bring in something that was familiar, but also unique in order to galvanize the community as well. So, you know, we, in essence, killed two birds with one stone. We helped the kids, we gave them, I helped to create an alternative form of outlet uh, to deal with trauma, with, uh, which a lot of these kids in certain neighborhoods within CMSD are dealing with verbal, physical, emotional abuse, gun violence, hunger, because in the summertime, if they're not in school, if they're not part of a school program, they don't have regular lunch or breakfast, um, and an addition or array of other areas. And the age group that I worked with was between the ages of four and 14. So I wanted to catch them right before that proverbial fork in the road where you can go down one path or the other, just so they know this is a new skill I picked up. And also to show them like classical is cool. So yeah. While it is important to help students cope with mental health, what can be done to reduce the chance of experiencing mental health issues to begin with? Um, fair, very good question. Um, part of my role um, at the board is to work with um, our agencies on providing prevention services. So prevention is when we're trying to stop something from occurring or from it developing and expanding, right? So um, the way that we can do that is one, education is important because I think it's very important for us to recognize that just because you are experiencing symptoms does not mean that you are a diagnosed mental illness, right? So there can be different situations that happen in your life that trigger these feelings of depression. You failed a test, you have um, didn't make a team, you uh, broke up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you're, certain things happen, you know, things are happening at home, somebody passes away. Those things are going to make you feel depressed, going to make you feel um, anxious, which is okay. That does not necessarily mean that you are now diagnosed with a mental illness. But what happens is if those types of things happen back to back to back to back, or it's never addressed, then we, ha we can start seeing a pattern and things can spin out of control. So what prevention does is at the onset of such a behavior or such a uh, situation happening, providing that support immediately in a way that is not so alarming and intimidating for you to get support. So what does that look like? Prevention looks like several things. Prevention is what we're doing today. Prevention is conversations, education, informing. Prevention is art and music. It's any way that you're able to express yourself that will cause you to feel a 
less weight of life on you. So what we can do before you are part of um, getting diagnosed is provide more opportunities for you to better express yourself in a safe environment and making sure that those opportunities are competent to the, the way that you want to express yourself. Because some may want to do it musically, some may want to do it with art, some may want to do it through a debate. Like, I just need to get it out, so let's debate about something. You know, some want to do it through, um, to, through uh, theater, whatever the case is, basketball, sports. These are all different forms of prevention because it allows you to utilize some type of skill that cope, that, to help you cope with life stressors. So those are the things that we can do. You're doing an awesome job with this right here with yes. prevention. Great job. What? One thing I want to say about, so what Sade was saying it was for the, for the students, one thing I want to bring awareness to as well is to the adults in the room. When we think about addressing the mental health and making sure that we're doing preventative work, a lot of times in schools we have so many resources. So when I was in the school, we had school counselors, we had mental health therapists, we had social workers, we had school psychologists and maybe not in the same building, but they were resources within the district. So I think it's very important when we think about this as the adults, how do we utilize the resources that we have at our fingertips? Many times we work in isolation because we're just trying to do the work, um, but I think it's important when we think about really addressing mental health in schools that we think about how do we pull these different resources and collaborate, and not just collaborate, but communicate with each other about what we're doing to better serve the students and the families. I think that's a big piece that oftentimes we miss within the school setting um, because everybody's so busy doing the work that we don't work together. So we have to think about it more from a um, tiered system, a mental health support. School counselors normally can address all students. School uh, mental health therapists can do more of the clinical mental health things within schools. And if we have outside agencies coming in, they can also provide additional clinical mental health. So we want to think about how do we utilize all those services. Can I add one more? So another part of prevention has to be being aware of policies that have led to adverse experiences for a lot of our youth um, that then get over pathologized and labeled as mentally ill or labeled as oppositional defiant. Um, in this area, racist policies like redlining, police practices, um, minimum sentencing for drug offenses, those, those policies had an impact on kids' experiences which then led to symptoms. So I, I think that we have to consider uh, the disproportionality in schools as well with suspension and expulsion, how, how these things are labeled. So not just the current implicit bias, but how policy impacts those things, educating and informing students so they have some agency to be a part of it, to understand that it's not some, some, some sort of internal deficit within them, um, but it's something outside. And I think that if we, can't, we can't dream of an equitable future without having an open, honest conversation about the inequities in the present. Mm -hmm. How does one make the decision to get therapy or to get help? Like, what is the threshold between having symptoms of a mental health disorder and actually having to get therapy for it? So intensity and duration is very important. So um, depending on how, and I'm, I'm going to use the code analogy um, because we've all experienced codes. We've all kind of felt a certain type of way. Um, if I am... If you are experiencing a, a cough and it's happening two times a day, it's like, okay, you know, I can tell that this is a symptom of something. But if it's full blown, you're coughing, you're sneezing, you have chills, and things are happening that you are not accustomed to, that is the difference. It's, it's as far as how much is it happening and how strong is it happening. Similar to the question about um, teenage behavior, what's the difference between regular teenage behavior and possibly an onset of mental illness or just need some mental health assistance? It's about that intensity. Teenagers are going to get upset. They're going to yell. They're going to slam their doors, whether we like it or not. But am I slamming my door and then putting a hole in the wall with my fist? Am I um, yelling at you and then going into a complete um, tantrum, throwing things and, you know, cutting myself or threatening to harm myself? Am I picking up items? These are, this, this intensity is so much stronger than just the normal behavior, right? Teenagers are going to want to be by themselves. They're going to want to say, I don't feel like hanging around with you, mom. But are they 
isolating themselves just for a certain period of time? Or do you find that when you go to open the door, it's always locked? Or when you mm -hmm. go, they're jumpy when because they didn't know you were mm -hmm. coming. Do you find that people who they were usually hanging out with, they're no longer hanging out with? That's intensity, that's duration. And those are the types of things that we want to look at both within our loved ones as well as ourselves to recognize, okay, I, I need to um, get some help and talk to someone. And we need to recognize that it's not, it's not a scary thing. It's a normal thing. And I, people who you see every day that you probably think are like the coolest people in the world have therapists, okay? They talk to somebody. The, the people who are in music videos, um, even if you listen to, um, Y'all go to Taylor Swift. Her songs are her therapy. She talks about getting her heart broken. She talks about how he liked her and not me. That's all therapeutic. And so it's okay that your mental health is normal. It's just as normal as you going to the doctor, going to the dentist and all of those things. And just like if we decide not to go get that six month checkup or get that cleanse, cleaning that we need for our dentist, the same goes with our mental health. So just remember duration and intensity for both yourself as well as those that you love that you want to look at to know if it's just something they're going through for the moment or if it's something that needs some ongoing help. Erin, I'd like you to speak to this. Um, you see someone struggling or showing one of these symptoms, uh, like maybe your friend, what exactly should you do? Who do you contact? Um, I, before I answer that, I, I'd say, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the uh, mental health, when you talk about that, it's intertwined with the healthcare industry in this country. So it takes a deficit-based approach, which is it's literally ticking off problems argumentative, oppositional, rule breaking, coming up with a diagnosis, which is what is wrong with you, and then figuring out the therapist, whoever figures out how to get reimbursement and continue with that. So, I mean, one, I'd like to switch it, and it, we should take a wellness approach. Um, if someone doesn't feel well and they're not doing well, then go ahead and seek help. I mean, it's up, this is the difference between adult and, and youth mental health. Adults come to terms with themselves but not about worrying too much or not feeling right, feeling depressed, or having trouble with relationships, and then they seek out a therapist. They Google therapist my area and they go, kids, adults are defining for them. We're ticking off what's wrong with them. So they have this, this passive, uh, they're a passive participant in it. Mm. Um, so again, like I'm, I keep going back to just empowering and giving them voice. If they feel like they're not doing well or not feeling well, then I'm, I'm going to connect you to someone. And it may not be me. It, it may be Archie. It may be the coach. It may be a neighbor. Um, the thing, intensity and frequency, that sort of thing, depending on how much it impacts the functioning, then you go down that continuum. And okay, now we might need to see a psychiatrist. Now we may not need to go and see um, you know, a, a licensed social worker. But oftentimes, kids just need someone to listen to, mm -hmm. a trusting adult, and a healthy outlet. I, I guess the other thing I would add is even if you feel well, mentally well, go see a therapist. Like, seriously. Like, like I said earlier, going to therapy is like going to the gym. It truly is because you're, to me, I always was, I've always been fascinated with how the mind works anyway. So to learn why cert certain behaviors happen or certain patterns happen, to me is just fascinating. But the thing about it is, I go to therapy whether or not I've great things have been happening or if I'm having a really tough time. It's the same thing. Because the thing about it also that a lot of people may not know is success breeds anxiety. Absolutely. Like, I, let me tell you, mm -hmm. over the past almost four years now that I've been doing this work, I mean, it's been this ascension with my career. But if I ain't go to therapy to talk about the pressures that goes on with this, I don't know where I'd be. The other thing I would say also to all of the black folk listening, watching, I was referred by a guy that looked like me. That's why I decided to start going to therapy. So start normalizing the conversation with each other. Start saying, hey man, like God, man, the last night I talked to my therapist. If, if, if that could be a normalized conversation, you'll see more and more people that look like us. And my therapist happens to look like me too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, and round of applause for our panelists.
Barbara. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Yang, and I'm a junior at Laurel School. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum on disparities in youth mental health care featuring Archie Green, mental health advocate and founder of Peeled and Layers Back, Sharday Hollins, the Children's Program Behavioral Health Prevention Specialist at the Alcohol, Drug, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of the Cuyahoga County, and Dr. Dakota King-White, an assistant professor in the Department of Counseling, Administration, Supervision, and Adult Learning at Cleveland State University, and Dr. Aaron Mutillo, the Director of Day Treatment Centers at Positive Education Program. Our moderator is Orimilo Arasanya, sophomore at Pinecrest Academy Homeschool. City Club Youth Forums is sponsored by AT&T with additional support from the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation. We appreciate your support. The community partner for Data's Forum is the Positive Education Program. Additionally, we welcome guests at the table hosted by the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board of Cuyahoga County, as well as students from Andrews Osborne Academy, Campus International High School, Citizens Leadership Academy Southwest, Fairview High School, Lutheran West High School, and MC Squared STEM High School. Support for student participation in City Club forums also comes from William M. Weiss Foundation with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We're happy to have all of you here. If you enjoyed today's forum, join us April 15th at noon for the sixth and final youth forum of 2019 to 2020 school year in which we'll be discussing sustainability in Cleveland. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you so much for the panelists. Thank you members and friends of the City Club. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.